Hey there. You know, if you're a frequent listener to our show, you already know that our show is brought to you by our friends over at Artillery Sports. But what you may not know is that Artillery Sports helps athletes of all types win on and off the course and court. They do this by selling quality, durable, and precision manufactured sports equipment that keeps you in the game, while also using a portion of the profits to provide the funding needed to care for our nation's veterans. With Artillery Sports, it's more than just a game. So head over to ArtilleriSports.com today to buy the quality equipment you need to keep you in the game and to help our nation's veterans at the same time. That's ArtilleriSports.com. Make sure you head on over there today. Oh, and use the code DOCFIRST to get 10% off your first order. Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at documentary filmmaking. I'm your host and a documentary filmmaker myself, Christian Taylor. And today I'm joined by two of the entertainment industry's most trusted distributors, in my opinion, and a lot of others. Friend of the show and former guest, Joe Amade, and his partner and first-time guest, Tim Maggiani. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. All right. Before we begin, I would like to say up front that Virgil Films is my distributor for The Girl Who Wore Freedom. However, they are only here because I've enjoyed a very positive, open, and honest relationship with these guys. I've learned so much about them um, or from them about the distribution business. And I feel that every filmmaker should, um, should know these same things that I'm learning kind of before they start distributing their film or settle on a distributor. Uh, just to be clear, they are not paying me to be here. So I just wanted to give that uh, disclaimer uh, right away. So but, but uh, you, are, yes. you are paying us, right? <laughs> in, a, in a manner of speaking, I would say that's true. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for making time. I know you are very busy. Uh, the truth is, I I love my relationship with you. And I think that is a very unusual thing for filmmakers to say about their distributors. I've heard a lot of filmmakers say they don't trust their distributors. They often don't get paid. They never hear from their filmmakers or their, their distributors. They don't take their phone calls. And that is not you. So, um, you know, this as you being on my podcast is evidence of that. So thank you. Anyway. Thank you. All right. Let's start a little bit by, um, you know, talking about uh, the distribution company that you have and who you are. We're going to do that now for this episode. We are going to do a two part episode, everybody. So uh, this is episode. Uh, I'm not sure what the number is, but it's the first of two parts. Uh, we'll do the next one in two weeks from now. And this week, we're going to tell you a little bit about Virgil Films and their bios. And then next week, uh, you're going to need to listen to this episode to hear them. So, uh, Joe, you were the one that started this business. You're the one that's been in it the longest. So talk about your company, mm -hmm. who you are, and then we'll scoot on over to Tim. Uh, very quickly, I when I was young, a very long time ago, um, I was fixing sewing machines for a living and uh, in Philadelphia for the Singer Sewing Machine Company in drove past a, a store that said video store and they had VHS cassettes in the window. I had no idea what it was. I walked in to a room surrounded by movies and I've loved movies since as long as I can remember. Um, and very quickly I got out of the uh, sewing machine business and into the video business. And, you know, I started as a guy behind the counter renting, renting videos and worked up to manager district manager. We ended up with 18 stores. Um, and then we ended up selling selling the company. And I went to work for a distributor out in California called IBE, which was a independent studio that also um, had ties to a bigger studio called Carol Co. So we got to release movies like all the Rambo films, the Terminator movies, um, you know, a lot of really big, big films. And so we're um, in the 80s now. We're in the we're, 80s. We're, we're, in, we're in the late 80s. Um, late 80s. My boss and his wife, um, Jose Menendez and Kitty Menendez, unfortunately, were brutally murdered by their sons mm -hmm. in the middle of all this. Um, and, uh, it, you know, the, the company got taken over by a couple of people. And after a few years, I decided I didn't want to stay there any longer um, and went to Turner. Ted Turner had a company at the time. Um, I actually followed my boss, a gentleman by the name of Stuart Snyder, to Turner. Uh, had a great career there for five years until Ted sold the company, uh, ended up at Polygram Home Video uh, out of New York City. Are we in the early 90s now? In the early 90s now. Um, things are going great. 
hologram cells. Uh, and the independent film division was taken over by a company called USA that is, was part of USA Network owned by Barry Diller. We had films like Traffic, Being John Malkovich. I was, and I was running that division. I was president of that company, of that division, reporting directly to a gentleman by the name of Scott Greenstein and Barry Diller. We had a lot of great independent films. Got to go to the Oscars twice because we had two wow. films in a row. Two years in a row, films nominated for Best Picture. And it was fantastic. Great career. This is and more then, like the, this is the later 80s, right? Like around 80s. 80s. Yeah. 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 Um, no, this is 90s. 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 Early 90s. 90s. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, we, I was working for USA actually in Toronto um, on 9-11. So you can put. Oh, put late 90s. There. Yeah. Late 90s. Yeah. So, and that's a whole, that's a whole podcast story. We can, we can go down the road. Um. Every and, time I talk with you, Joe, you throw in more details I've never heard. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I better ask him about that yeah. next time. It's it's me, too. I, some of these, you know. It was like, crazy. It was <laughs> it was pretty crazy. I mean, and um, you're related to him, right? We haven't even gotten into that, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. now that you've said that, because no one knows that but Tim and I. Now, <laughs> yeah, I am. I am. Uh, he's um, he's my dad. And uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> we have very young blood in the Amade and Maggiani family. But anyway, I ended up that, he, again, the company got sold to Universal. They didn't need two video companies. And at that point, even though I had, you know, successful careers with Turner, great relationship with Ted Turner, great relationship with Barry Diller, didn't help any when, you know, he sold the company. I didn't want to do it anymore. And I wrote, and this is a cliche, I wrote a half-ass business plan and hit the streets in New York. Um, and within days, I found some partners, uh, John Hart and Jeff Sharp. We started a company called Hart Sharp. Uh, we went out acquiring films. First film I acquired, the very first film I acquired was a documentary called Super Size Me. That put us on the map. Um, we got bought by an English conglomerate called Arts Alliance. That lasted for about five years. And then 20 years ago, this past October, that company was sold to me personally, and we changed the name to Virgil Films. And we've been, you know, we've been going on since then. Well, that covers your bio as well as the company bio. So I was going to say we were going to do a quick bio and that wasn't so quick. <laughs> However, uh, I was going to get you to do two of those things. And so now really it was, you know, <clears throat> two and a half minutes each. We'll give you that. <laughs> so right. that is an exciting lifetime of, um, or an adult, well, really a kid lifetime to adult lifetime of, um, in this business. Yeah, it's cool. it's, that's really amazing. Yeah. And you've seen it go through an immense amount of changes. Just a quick question before we slide on over to Tim. Have you ever seen as much change in a short amount of time, in a short amount of time, that's the qualifier, as you have in the last four years? No. Yeah, that's Nowhere. what I figured. Nowhere near it. No. That's what I thought the answer would be. All right, Tim, let's talk about you. Now that well, you are dad and is, you know that you are, um, what's that? What's that film with Brad Pitt uh, where the guy um, Benjamin Buttons? That's it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah obviously, <laughs> yeah. I'm Joe's father. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. So I, I mean, my bio obviously isn't as long as that, but I, I first met Joe. It starts off because I first met Joe. Um, at a family reunion in <laughs> had to have been the mid nineties. Um, and a guy walked in with a box of VHS tapes <laughs> with screener Chiron burn on a lot of them and, um, and let the, uh, let the family have at it to, for a bunch of VHSs. And, uh, I can't remember what movies specifically were in there, but, um, I, that's the first I'd heard. Um, that he'd worked in the film industry. And how and old were you at the time? I had to have been 13, 14, hmm. um, not maybe 12. I, I, I don't remember exactly, but I remember that making an impression on me for sure. And I had always been, um, you know, I, I'd always loved movies. Um, you know, I would watch everything that I could at that point. But it also, I, I also did quite a bit of, 
filmmaking myself with friends and funny videos and things before YouTube obviously took off. So it was always now, into- Now, hang on a second. Let me it, ask it, you, how old were you at this time? Because how were you making these movies? Uh, home home video cameras. And we were taking them. Um, and back when they had the little cassette tapes. Um, yes. Over, so this would be early shoulder. 2000s? Yeah, yeah, this would, no, this would have been before that. This would have been the late 90s. Late uh, 90s, 96, okay. 97, 98, 99. Um, but so I obviously, I went to college in 1999. Um, I started, um, I was a political science pre-law major. Then I decided I might not want to go that route. So I changed communications media with a uh, focus on script writing. Hmm. I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, so, you know, uh, the film industry being what it, what it is, it's very difficult to get your foot in the foot in the door. And I was lucky enough, um, to, um, have Joe as what third cousin once removed or second, oh, yeah. twice removed. I don't know. but, um, so he gave me an internship, um, in 2004. And so I, I started off in New York City. Um, I didn't know much about the distribution industry. Um, and uh, after I finished my internship, Joe offered me a job. Um, and I started doing viral marketing for films, going into like forums and planting seeds of things like that. Uh, MySpace was big for film back then. Wow, yeah. Um, doing and then managing websites for films. And then eventually, um, in about 2006, digital started to really become a thing where people were renting and downloading and nobody had really filled in that position yet at Virgil, where at the time it was Heart Chart Video and then Arts Alliance, but um, nobody had filled in that role and Joe gave me the opportunity to take it and run with it. So um, found out who all the major retailers were and we started getting deals done. Um, and we were lucky that we did that because very shortly after that, they started closing up um, all their contracts. Um, so they didn't do any more deals with companies like us. So we were very lucky. Well, to what get were they doing? Deal. I'm sorry? If they going weren't through, doing deals. Going through third parties. The, so they, they, weren't, yeah. they weren't doing, so they weren't doing, they don't do one-off deals with filmmakers. You have to have a distribution company. They're not w that willing to open up new distributors. Right. So they, they like their existing uh, distributors that have a relationship with them. So oftentimes, you know, that would mean that, you know, someone else would have to, they would have to come through us in order to get their film up on, let's say, back at the time, Voodoo. It's now Fandango at Home and Amazon. So we were lucky enough to, to get in at an early time. And then obviously 2006, I think uh, Joe famously told on this podcast last time, uh, Ted Sarandis reached out looking for movies and, we we shipped them a box of DVDs <laughs> to put up on their service, and you know that that used to be the delivery. Um, and then uh, it changed. Well, he to also digital. told him that he thought it was a silly idea and that it wasn't going <laughs> to yep. go anywhere. Yep. yep. So last you know, words. back then, you know, back then um, that was the delivery. I mean, you delivered a DVD, um, DigiBeta if you had it, which is obviously standard definition. Um, and they would take it and put it up on the service. Um, now that's not the case anymore. Netflix is the gold standard of delivery. It's not the same. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, I, I just continued to do that. And as the opportunities came um, to expand digital, I, I, I took that on. And um, a couple of years ago, Joe named me co-president. So um, yeah. That's that's yeah. kind of my story. What he's what he's leaving out. What what's that? What he's leaving <laughs> out. Um is at the time, you know, I was running a company that was releasing movies on VHS. I mean that's that's what it was. And as I stated earlier, um I've been a movie buff, hardcore movie buff since the time I was born. So I know movies. I, I can I can tell you who won Best Supporting Actor in nineteen thirty nine, but I can't what I can't do um, is wrap my head around the the delivery of digital, the the you know even the language of digital. You're an analog uh, guy. I am an analog <laughs> guy, and I don't care enough. Should I don't care enough about all the other stuff because I really don't like it. You know, mm -hmm. to me, I'd still rather be putting movies in the theaters. 
So all of a sudden this kid comes along and, and he gets it like that quick. I mean, he didn't have to go to school and study it. He didn't have to read up on books. This is a whole new field and he gets it. And it's, mm -hmm. it just so happens to be it's Tim. So he's in the right place at the right time. But I knew that he could run with it and build the digital business. Mm -hmm. So the Virgil digital business, which is the Virgil business these days, would not be where it is at without Tim. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a very fortunate man because you are correct. I was actually having this conversation with my son the other day who's interested in the business. And we've been talking about uh, just you know, things adapting and changing and how rapidly it is happening and what the new, uh, th what's happening next. And I, the point is, if you don't adapt, you die. And I'm sort of in the same place right now, Joe, where I'm watching these younger kids who are doing everything on their phones. They're shooting, they're editing, they're uploading, they're doing yeah. all of that on their phones. And they are also writing and they're they're content curating and they're marketing. They're doing everything themselves. They have one person and they're able to do everything. And for me right now, I'm still one of those filmmakers that's collaborating with an editor and a writer and all of those things which cost me money. And if I don't learn how to do some of these things that I don't want to do, uh, you know, I'm quickly going to be paced out of what's happening right now. And you were fortunate enough that somebody came along that knew all of that stuff and was willing to partner with you and expanded your business that way. Yeah. And, and, and again, back then we were fortunate when the digital business started that we already had really strong relationships with everybody right. because I grew up with those, excuse me, those same, those same people. Yeah. So the Ted Sarandis's of the world, they worked at video stores. They were in the <laughs> video business. So I knew these people. I was close friends with these people. So it gave us the in. So then when, the business started to grow, all of a sudden, Netflix and Hulu said, oh, no, no, we, every distributor like you in the world here is not going to be able to come to us anymore and pitch. So they would send distributors to us and we would two-step the product in. So therefore, the filmmakers getting a double, sometimes a triple fee. So that brings me all the way to today, since your, your podcast is being looked at by filmmakers. Here's the advice. When you are looking for a distributor, make sure that that distributor can go directly to all of those accounts that you and I um, took a uh, girl to on a direct basis, meaning Joe doesn't have to go to another company because that because he doesn't have those relationships. Because a lot of distributors will not tell you that they don't have those relationships. That's so true. <laughs> That's so true. That's what happened to me the first time around. They pr they tell you that they have these relationships or they have these ends, uh, but then when you get tr down to it, you realize that they don't. I do think the difference with you, and fortunately, it has been, you've been in it so long, you know these people, you can still walk in the door. And I think that is going to be if not already gone, it will be gone very, very quickly because they're not even almost doing business like that anymore. I mean, the young people are coming in and they're not almost like they want to do business without meeting people face to face, which I think is crazy. But well, let, me, let, me, let me stop you there. I'm sorry. that That's not true. You don't think that's true? All right. It's not true for me. So tell me what happens. I, the, uh, the last week of April or pull up when the Turner Classic Movies Festival was because I was in LA. The festival started on Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I sat in front of Apple, Hulu, Disney, Netflix, Netflix, three different times, um, not Amazon. So those four people I met with face-to-face. -face. And so when you're- And CNN, who's not even buying anything anymore, but I met with that person too. So when you're in the room and you're taking, tell me what's happening. You're, you're going in there, you're talking to film buyers, I'm assuming. And in your case, it's documentary film buyers. What's it like in there? So it's, you're in a room. Um, sometimes you're in a room. Sometimes, you know, it, in, in some cases you're meeting in, uh, in their cafeteria. So you can have lunch with the person or something like that. Really, really all depends. And so I will pretend that you are one of the buyers. And I'm and I'm sitting in front of you and I say, so, you know, one of the movies we have coming next month or in three months from now is this movie called The Girl Who Wore Freedom. And 
I got to tell you, I watched this film. You need to make sure you watch this screener. Um, a lot of it's in, in subtitles, but that's okay. You're going to get the story. And I guarantee you, you're going to cry because the film is that emotional. Um, and yeah, there's been about a gazillion movies made about D-Day, but not like this. And then I go on and I talk about the street date. I talk about you. Um, I talk about maybe other projects that you're involved in. Um, sometimes I will show the trailer. But that's that's a decision that's made when you get there. Because sometimes there's noise in the background and sometimes you know the buyer's a little bit rushed. So you're not going to take two minutes. And it is a classic. Uh, they used to call it boy meets girl, boy loves girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back pitch. That's what it is. It's a classic pitch. And they want it to happen. Why a lot of people still aren't doing it, I have no idea. All I can tell you is that is that I'm doing it. And I've been in that building. I've been in those buildings where the next meeting is a major star. And they're doing the same thing I'm doing. Maybe more successfully, but they're doing the same thing I'm doing. Uh, you want to meet celebrities in Hollywood? Sit in the lobby at Netflix all day. Hmm. It's it's You're just like, holy shit. Excuse me. Um, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is, by the way, the worst place you can't walk up to them in the lobby of Netflix. Let me no, make sure of course I say not. that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it's interesting People because they People they are really pitching. are the the big celebrities are making and pitching their own films these days, truthfully. And um, yeah. you, you're right. You are you are one of a vanishing breed who is still willing to kind of go in there and and take those meetings. And that's what is I do love about you, you know, I know that you have those relationships. And so you're telling me, even though I hear about all these huge turnovers at all these companies and all these people getting fired, you're telling me you still know people there. I know people at every, yeah. Yeah. I could tell. I've always, we're very honest. I, I could tell you where I don't know people. Okay. I don't know people at Peacock. I don't know people at Paramount plus. These are the companies that came into play during COVID. Mm. So so I'm not seeing them face to face. I'm pitching them through Zoom or email or however they they want it. But everybody else, and yeah, I mean, I've had I don't know ten buyers at Netflix throughout the years. Yeah, I've had five well, or six buyers at Hulu. I know. Them all. I appreciate your honesty. Honestly, that's why I love you. Um, you you were telling me, you know, we talked during COVID. My movie was came out during COVID, and you were telling me that back then it was terrible. Everybody. Uh, Everything was done, I think, you know, through virtual. And I remember near the end when COVID was, quote, over and they were beginning to take meetings, you went out there and then they still, they were going to meet with you and then they didn't. I remember. So has, has it rebounded now and they're willing to take these meetings now and we're past that? Um, I can only speak for our own um you know, our own company. And as I stated in April, I saw everybody. Um, we've had a, some health issues here within my family. Um, that has stopped me from going out this summer, but I am now making my next round of meetings for last week of September, first week of October. Okay. Um, now, Tim, you have been, you know, your role has been primarily behind the scenes in terms of all the tech stuff and working with the filmmakers. I mean, I will say it, Joe, in a sense, is the rainmaker. He he meets the filmmakers. He talks with them. He speaks their language. He has made films before. Um, you guys have, you know, done your own films. And so he speaks their language, but he also knows the the buyers and can speak with them. And then once it's all done, he turns us over to you and you then take it from there and you know, um, you know, our specs and you walk us through everything that needs to be delivered to you and talk us through that whole process, which is super scary and overwhelming. And then you work with the platforms to figure out how, you know, to get that done. It's, it's a nightmare and um, you have ushered us through that beautifully but i do think you're you're taking on more uh more other things as well so talk to us about you know everything that's been going on talk to us about what it's like to watch joe do his thing which you've learned yeah so obviously joe's been doing this since papyrus um so he's uh that's <laughs> sorry um uh but uh so yeah he's he's been doing this he's been doing his dog and pony show for forever 
Um, so he he knows that game. Um, as far as like the materials that are presented to them, like I you know I will create a deck for every single film, whether it be it really depends on the platform too, whether it be a one page or whether it be like a full blown up you know visual deck with 15, 20 pages, more information on the film, um, links, uh, cast and crew bios and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll create all those ancillary materials that he'll use. Oh, as, so even uh, when we bring... give you our deck for like, you know, distribution, once you accept yep. us, you create your own deck yep. that you, yeah, that, right. yeah, and, and it's, yours. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's, you know, it's different because well, every we, single, we use element. You know, whether, yeah. Whether it's a streamer, like let's say if you're pitching a film as an original, that would have to be more yeah. a larger pitch, more visual, um, idea based, longer, um, you know, background on all the the crew, the cast involved. Um, if it's a finished film, generally it's a little bit shorter because you have a trailer. A lot of times you have um, you have finished piece of content. You have you can send them the screener link. So a lot of times we just use the key art, selling points, and stuff like that. So it's different for every platform, and how they want to be pitched is different mm -hmm. as well. Um, TVOD's a little bit different. Some of them have their own platforms that they prefer us for to For those through. who are new, just explain TVOD. Transactional VOD, whether it be Video on demand. You forgot the rest of yes. it. <laughs> yes. Video on demand, um, and also electronic sell-through, which is download to own. So if you download something, it saves it to your cloud. You can watch it at any time. Um, so yeah, and, and their pitch process is a little bit different. Um, and some of them prefer to be pitched through portals and, um, via email, some via phone, some, you know, really depends zoom. Um, it's, it's kind of all over the, all over the place as far as what, how they want their, uh, films presented to them. Okay. And so you, you make these pitches and you present them. What else do you do after that? Well, um, I also obviously work with delivery. <laughs> um, so delivery, you know, I, I would say it's it's a little daunting when you look at the delivery on our contract, right? Yes, There's your lots contract. Of in there. <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness! Well, it's when I it's, first got that contract. I mean, listen, ours isn't that bad considering some of the other ones that are out there. Trust me, trust me about that. But and delivery is pretty simple. You know, typical Apple ProRes mezzanine file that we take and then create subsequent trans codes to deliver to all the platform specs. So I'll manage that whole process to make sure that Apple's getting their package how they want it. Amazon's getting their package how they want it. Google, you know, Fandango, they're all getting their package how they want it. And then, you know, Netflix, like I said, the gold standard for delivery, that's a whole different beast. Um, but that's, you know, that's something we do as well. And we manage that process to make sure that everything everything works. If there's any issues, I communicate it back to the filmmaker. Working in documentaries, a lot, a lot of it might be archival footage, so you're working with the best source available. Um, so it's a lot of going back and forth, but um, I try to take the, the terror out of the filmmaker's eyes uh, and minds when, when they see our delivery, because in, in reality, um, it's a lot simpler than it looks, but there's a lot of specifications in there about, you know, 422 HQ file 709 so all that kind of stuff but it's um it, it when it comes down to it it's it's uh, I like to think it's a pretty easy process or I try to make it as easy as possible well I will say you know about your contract I don't want me people to think it's overwhelming what I mean by your contract was overwhelming the contract between you guys is basically just a page. It's like, here's our agreement with whatever we right. decide yeah. upon. And, and truthfully, that's negotiable too. You know, we cut things out of our, people may wonder how I'm able to do all these theatrical things all over the world. It's because we cut theatrical out of our contract and you guys were okay with that. So it is yeah. negotiable in terms of what we want to keep and you want to do at the time. And uh, you guys may decide you don't want to do that and you don't want to distribute us, et cetera. It's what we decide upon. So that is really cut and dry, pretty easy. It's standard pretty much with everybody else. The heavy part is all of the back part with all of the deliverables. And so for somebody mm -hmm. like me, who's not an editor or a graphic designer, there are deliverables in there that are very you know, editor focused or cinematographer focused yeah. or graphic design artist focused. And so when mm -hmm. I saw them, I was like, 
how the heck am I going to do that? And you were so understanding because you didn't make me feel stupid. Like it's okay. I understand these are tough. We'll work it. We'll work well, you through it. And you did. I will tell you, there are still platforms that surprise me yeah. with what they want for delivery. Yeah. Um, and like, like I said, even with, you know, with us, when we're, we're delivering to new platforms, a lot of times that delivery is negotiable as well. So like, you know, they might want something that might not exist mm -hmm. for, for us to go back and have it created. It's usually not worth it mm -hmm. a lot of times. Um, so we, we'll go back and negotiate that as well. But it's, um, you know, in, in who's to say what that'll be in two, three years from now, Yeah. you know, um, what delivery will be. Well, it just changes because um, platforms change and everything changes. Yeah. So that's one thing that I'm learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've only been in this business now for, <laughs> I don't know, nine years and everything changes all the time. I do think yep. you're right. Everything, we have to remain flexible because just since my relationship with you and like you're saying, even an hour agreement, like we didn't have an agreement initially for you guys to distribute internationally. You've now mm -hmm. distributed to France for me. And that just happened because I kept saying you guys, isn't there anything more we can do? Can't we distribute this anywhere else? And I don't know how it happened, but you're like, we talked to, we pitched you anyway. We pitched you anyway, I think, to Canal Plus and they're interested. And yeah. quite frankly, it's been yeah. the best deal that we had. You know, we've yeah. had, it's been amazing. Yeah. But that has been crazy deliverables that nobody expected. <laughs> we've had that to is, you know, it, it, Right. Exactly. That goes to what Tim, again, is not, is not saying, because, um, he, he, he's not going to put on the hat that basically says he does just about everything. The when we release a film, and this is I'll say this: this is unlike most other distributors. We continue to sell that film throughout the term. So in year two, right. in year three, in year four, we're trying to still trying to figure out ways to make money on that title. It's a very right. selfish reason we have to make money too. Yeah, and we're not going to make any money if we're not out there or Tim's not out there pitching it to the promotions on iTunes or the promotions at whatever, Amazon. Yeah. And so there is a constant every month. In fact, there's quite a few months that Tim will call me and say, hey, you know, we're only releasing one movie this month. Let's do a, a company-wide promotion, 99 cents for a week or something like that. He, he does those things all the time, not just yeah. um, on the anniversary of D-Day with your film or you know, Veterans Day, Memorial Day. That's the, that's the easy ones, you know. Um, it's all the ones that fit in between. And that's Tim, Tim's responsibility as well. And he does it very, very well. Yeah. 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 I mean, Tim, were you going to say something? I don't want to speak over you. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's just, you know, that's, yeah, that's one of the things that we continue to do throughout the term of our agreement is, and honestly, like Joe said, because we have to, yeah. I mean, um, but we're constantly finding, we're trying to find new ways to promote titles that may be out for two, three years. One of the important decisions we make in acquiring the film is if it's evergreen, that's always important to us too. Um, because, you know, you don't want to release something that has a finite period of time where it's going to work. And let's, you want something that's going to work. For yeah. Let's talk term. about evergreen. Um, I mean, our film, thankfully, that's one of the reasons I was really excited about it is yeah. D-Day comes around every year, but also Veterans Day and Fourth of July and VE Day. And so we can keep marketing it. Mm -hmm. um, but why don't you talk about there are other there are other reasons for evergreen content. Talk about that real quick. You know, the holidays, yeah. obviously, anything holidays. that's holiday driven, yeah. you know, Christmas is the most evergreen of all. But um you know, some people do say, all right, well, you just released a movie about fighting cancer. And I, I don't even know what month it is, but every everything has a month. <laughs> everything has an anniversary, whether it be the Holocaust, whether it be cancer, breast cancer, uh, lung cancer, leukemia. And so you can say, all right, I'm going to promote the film during all of these yearly th yearly anniversaries. But in most cases, that just doesn't work. Um you have to make sure you're in, yeah, you got to make sure that you're a part of all of those things, but you have to make sure you're in the non-noticeable ones, the just the normal promotions where there, there is a group of titles together of all different subject matters, and all of those titles are a price reduction. I used to compare it, or when I talked to filmmakers, um, I compared it to walking into Barnes & Noble, into their film into their film department when they had one, and you saw all these DVDs, and you saw buy one, get one free. 
it's the same thing. Yeah. It's exactly yeah. the same thing. It's well, and let me explain to people kind of what they're talking about. We sort of skipped over it and we're talking about shorthand because you've explained this to me before. But, you know, the big problem here with independent films, and I've just wrestled with this like crazy, is there is no way when you're in the TVOD space or AVOD space, when you're not on Netflix, and even if you are on Netflix, even if Netflix had picked us up, there is no way for anybody to know about your film because there's no billboards anymore. There's no magazines anymore. There's no advertisements on TV anymore for a film like mine. So how in the world is anybody going to know about the girl who wore freedom unless I'm out there telling people what it is, you know? And so there are some very small ways. I mean, there are ways. Sure. You can be on social media buying ads or, but there's no way to check if your money is actually giving, if there's a return on that investment. And sometimes you can play with those things. But in our case, it's not so much. There are ways that you have explained to me, like for Amazon, for example, or Apple, they do these promo times for, let's take Veterans Day, for example. They'll say, okay, this is our Veterans Month. And so we're going to have veteran film promos. And so we're going to pitch your film among with another, other slates of films we have uh, for this promo that Amazon is doing. And then Amazon will decide, okay, we're going to put these films in our promo at a lower rate in hopes that more people will see it. And then that will get the ball rolling to increase your sales. Am I right about all that? You're, you're right. The, you know, for me, I never see those promotions because when I go to the site, I just go to the new release and pick a new release to watch. But most people will scroll down to those 99 cent films. I'm not, I'm not part of that part of that majority. It's, you know, millions of people will do that, uh, and they and they check them out all the time, um, yeah. and that's how these things work. I find I'm sure all of us have been through this. When you're late at night, you're looking for something oh, to watch, God. and you end up spending 25 minutes scrolling, yes. um, and watching and trailers and reading. Yeah, and and at the end of the day, I usually settle on Seinfeld again <laughs> for the one millionth time. Um, but that, but that's, um, but that's. That's the world we live in of instant gratification. Um, And knowing that you have a millisecond to attract somebody to to your film. Um, And a lot of times it's based off of thumbnail artwork. Yes, Um, another key thing I learned. Based off of thumbnail artwork, that is a huge thing. And I wish I would have known that in the beginning. I think that's worked against us in some ways, but... Yeah, we always say big for small, right? That's the best way to portray your artwork is not you you want to have very little noise in the background. You don't want to have anything that's going to be you know kind of jumbled together or you might not be able to make out a piece of content. So really focal on your key art, right? And kind of almost like a I don't want to say solid color, but not a very, you know, a muted background. So you can really have your image stand out because like I said, you don't have a whole lot of time to get um, that viewer. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really important. Yep. Well, speaking of thumb art, we're, we're going to wrap this segment yes. up so we can get to our next one. I see some thumb art behind you of forks over knives. Yes. And, uh, yes. I'm just wondering, talk to us a little bit about, uh, this uh, film. Apparently you distributed this film and there might be some, some stories that, uh, went along with this, uh, distribution. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, I have no idea what she's talking about. Can you tell me? <laughs> well, if you haven't heard of Forks Over Knives, um, it's it's a huge documentary. It's one of our continual bestsellers. It finds new a new audience every day. Um, the filmmakers um, went off and created a magazine after they made the movie, which is, believe it or not, like one of the top selling magazines in Walmart. Number one magazine. Um, so Walmart. It is the number one. Yeah, it is. Right? They came, it is. you know, they came to us with this film that was the first film to really mm-hmm. say in its film, in the film, that um, if you adopt not a diet, I want to be very specific here, not a diet, but a lifestyle of eating plant based, you know, plant based lifestyle. I mean, you're not eating meat, you're not eating eggs, you're no sugar, sugar's out of the question, dairy's out of the question. Um, you're eating. What is growing in the ground? Pretty simple. Um, that you yeah. will, if you it, you can you can eradicate uh, certain cancers from your body, arthritis, 
diabetes is at the top of the list. And, you know, this movie shows examples where it's working. So it started this whole uh, industry and lifestyle that millions and millions of people have now adapted. And there's been multiple films. So obviously, when we first started doing it, you know, you're working with these filmmakers and they're pretty hardcore. And you're you're talking to people that, that had diabetes that don't have it anymore. You're talking to people that had high blood pressure and aren't on blood pressure medicine anymore. So all of us tried it for a while. All of us. <laughs> it's very hard never to eat a piece of pizza again. All right. Um, so we went out to so we were invited to dinner by the man who produced the film. Great guy who we became very, very good friends with. And we got to his place for dinner and dinner um, was a big bowl of the biggest strawberries we've ever seen. I mean, they were almost the size of apples and oranges and lettuce with no dressing. And that was our dinner. And we ate a lot of strawberry, Tim and I, a lot of strawberries that night. Um, our mm -hmm. our fingers were red. Yep. We, uh, the dressing for the salad was a, he cut open an orange and squeezed the orange. And that's what we had for dinner. Now I will let we we you know, there was no dessert. Um we ate our full and we thanked him for dinner and we left and then I'll let Tim say what we did for the rest of the night. Uh we immediately um left. Or like we laughed and immediately both of us looked at each other and said we're starving. <laughs> So unfortunately, we went to an In and Out Burger, um, and uh, you probably feel guilty it, about it, it to this day. I'm sure. I feel really guilty about it, especially I got the poster behind <laughs> yeah. me. Just and, and, but, and, um, and the reality is, we paid for eating the at least I did um, for eating the In and Out Burger. But you know, this is 15 years ago, 12 years ago. Everything that this this movie says is true, and we have released quite a few right. films with the same storyline and we are about to release a couple other films that take it to the next level of where science and medicine and doctors have now come to most recently and findings that they find out you know they find and um yeah and forks over knife started it all and we're very proud of it and the whole idea is would you rather have a fork going into your mouth or would you have a have a knife cutting you for an operation mm -hmm. yeah that's so a great we're one very very proud um of of that film and that's probably in our top five of all time yeah well i want to that's yeah. a great story i appreciate you sharing that i want to go back a little bit when you were talking about and we do have to wrap up but I, there's just so much i could talk to you about um, i do want to clarify a thing you said um that you keep repping a film and you keep trying to sell the film because you have to and i want to clarify that comment you have to because you are a small shop and you keep right. it small on purpose because you mm -hmm. care about your filmmaker. This is what I have heard you say, but it's also what I've experienced. You care about your filmmakers. You care about the relationship with them. You also care about your families and your work-life balance. And in order to, to make all of that possible, you choose to keep your roster small and to work hard for that roster. And that is different mm -hmm. than other big distributors who I think have a different business model and it's just the way they do their business, which is we're going to take as many titles as we can and we're just going to take the titles and we're going to distribute them. And th they then distribute them, but they focus on the ones that are making the more money and hope that over time, the um, a massed amount of films will make them income, I think. Um, yeah. So people, I think, would just need to decide, you know, when you're looking for a distributor, what kind of relationship do you want to have? Now, yeah. personally, I made my yeah. choice. I made a choice where I cared about that relationship and I would rather be a collaborator with somebody who's distributing my film, who cares about it and will keep taking my calls and working with me to get my film out there and, you know, to help make us both money, um, then right. just thrown in a library with a big name that I could say I was distributed by X. 
Yeah. Did I you miss know, anything? Yeah. 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 No. The, 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 the main thing is, and this is just, this is just the fact of the matter is I learned very early in my career that, um, you know, I, I, I love movies. I mean, and that goes all the way back to, you know, 1915 silent films. I love film. Um, but with the exception of my family and friends, it's movies are probably the most important thing to me. Um, I see at least a movie a day, sometimes two or three. Um, that's my life. And I, when I get into the business, I felt so fortunate that I'm selling, I'm talking about movies for a living. But I also learned very quickly that movies are make believe. And the reality is it's a business Mm -hmm. and businesses have to make money or they won't survive. So Mm -hmm. yeah, we do it. We, 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 we decided to conduct our business in a certain way where we don't release 20 films a year. We like working with filmmakers. That's a pleasure that we get. And we also get a, a hell of a lot out of releasing movies that, you know, maybe you'll get lucky and you will enlighten somebody in some way or another. Fork server knives enlighten people. Super size me definitely enlighten people. Your film brought a side to a story that everyone thought they knew everything about and they didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, when that doesn't happen a lot, but when it happens, it's a great feeling. I mean, it, it really, really is. Yeah. The bottom line is you gotta make money, you gotta make money, or you know, the doors are gonna close. So every once in a while you'll see us release a horror movie or something like that. Um, that makes that is a little bit easier and le- less risk averse um, to some of the documentaries that we have that we have released. Um, but in turn, when we we do not make money unless the filmmaker is making money, you know, um, sure. and that is a major difference between us and a lot of other distributors out there. Yep, very true. All right, so before we go, we usually do a segment called DocuView Deja Vu. So we're going to do that. We are now heading into everybody's favorite segment called DocuView Deja Vu. All right, guys, this is your turn to just talk about uh, a couple of documentaries that are either old and on your roster that you want people to know about or that are just coming out or you're about to release or you just released. Oh. The ones so that we have released. Uh, we don't have anything. Yeah, this, these are. I didn't even give you prep for not this. Since, but you, you know, not since the girl who wore <laughs> freedom. I don't think we have anything that is worth. It. <laughs> Stop it. Uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about um, one of the films that we released uh, last year, which has been a really good surprise for us, which is a film called Just One Mile. Um, and it's a film about this mid-state mile race that happens in Tennessee. And it follows this guy, Chad Wright, who is a uh, former Navy SEAL, motivational speaker, has a pretty dedicated following um, and, you know, has a YouTube channel. It's not a crazy following. It's not like in the tens of millions of following, but he's it, he's got a very dedicated following. But it's a documentary um, about this race. And it's it's only a mile race. I think the elevation change, it's a loop. The elevation change is maybe 200 feet each each lap. Um, but the, the catch is it's an endurance race and that it keeps going until there's one person standing and that is the winner of the race. And just imagine how long that could possibly go. And you have this guy, Chad Wright, who is a mind over matter. I can take anything down in front of me kind of guy. And um, I'll let you watch the documentary if you're interested, but um, it's a great story. It's an unbelievable triumph of mind over matter. Um, and it's inspirational and all those things. Um, and it's been a, a good film for us. Um, and it's inspirational. It's all the things that we look at when we look to acquire. A film. Awesome. All right, Joe, you get one. You know, I continue to push a film that's two or three years old now called Seven Yards. And Seven Yards tells the story of Chris Norton, 19-year-old kid playing football for a college out in, in uh, Iowa who gets hurt. It's paralyzed from the neck down. He's told he's never going to walk again. And uh, cut to today. Not only is he is he he's not walking, but he's in a wheelchair. And he does TED talks all around the country. He's married. He has six kids. He has mm-hmm. fostered twenty seven kids. He is a quintessential 
inspiration in every single way. I'm very fortunate that he's become a very close friend. We're working on another project together that we can get into maybe next time we talk called Wheelchair Camp. Um, he's an amazing guy. It's an amazing movie. It's one of the few movies in the past five years that Netflix actually renewed after its first shot. Um, That's awesome. And tear jerking, um, but just just a great film all around. Awesome. Great to know. This has been wonderful, everybody. I just am so thankful that you guys took time. Uh, Listen, people, we are going to do another episode, so it'll air in two weeks. But also, if you are um, on our Patreon, which we have just rebooted, we've got a whole bunch of exciting things happening over in Patreon, so do go check it out. We are going to do another segment with these guys that's going to be Patreon only. So uh, if you want to hear more uh, from Tim and Joe, you'll definitely need to join us on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash documentary first it is the place to be all right everybody thank you so much for uh, listening here at documentary first where we believe everybody has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it bye everybody bye-bye thank you